Hello and welcome to the Credible Faith Show, episode number 17, issue number two of Off the Books, the part of the show in which I talk to authors, thinkers, or whoever else has made an impact through writing or other forms of communication. And today I have with me Professor Walter Schultz. Dr. Schultz, thank you for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Paul. Oh, that's great. A couple things at the beginning uh, for those of you who are listening who don't know who Walter Schultz is. He is a professor of philosophy at Northwestern University. Is that correct, Walter Schultz? Uh, actually, it's the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Okay, thank you for the correction. And Walter is quite a scholar on Jonathan Edwards, and the reason for him coming on the show today just has to do with that. He's written two articles, among a number of things, on Edwards. One of them is published in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society, The Metaphysics of Jonathan Edwards' End of Creation. And the other one is Jonathan Edwards' Concept of an Original Ultimate End, which is also published in the Journal of the Evangelical Theological Society. And I wanted to come on and talk with Edward, or talk about Edwards, and quick disclaimer the front. I've only read part of the work that both of these articles deal with, uh, which is concerning the end for which God created the world. I've only read part of it, and that was actually in Portuguese translation. So I'm going to be a learner here with you, and Walter is going to be our teacher for the next however long this interview goes. Some of this stuff may be somewhat heady and philosophical, so if that seems somewhat above your head, I would hope that we'd, we'd bring it down to a level that's more easy to understand or that he would. But if that is the case, just FYI, this may be in comparison to future ones, this may be somewhat more challenging philosophically in regards to getting your head around it. And is there anything else to do? Oh, well, before we get into some of the material from these two articles, uh, Walter, let's hear a little bit about you. For someone who doesn't know who you are before listening to this podcast, can you tell us about yourself, some of your background personally or spiritually? It would be nice to get a sense of who you are before we dive into some of your academic work here on Edwards. Okay. Married. I have two daughters, became a Christian in 1970 through the Navigators. Nice. How were they used in you becoming a believer? I was a college student at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, okay. and the Navigator representative at that time, Dwayne Bunt, was just making friends with us, and I had the opportunity to hear him, but he shared the gospel with me. Okay. And when I heard uh, some of those scriptures, they just made sense. And I think God made me alive in Christ at that time because everything changed. Okay. That's cool. I, then I got three degrees in philosophy after having been well rooted in scripture and scripture memory, uh, okay. thanks to the work of the navigators in the church that my wife and I attended. And so you were in college then. How old approximately were you when Dwayne Bunt talked? I was 20 years old. I'm 69. Okay. And what was your background coming into that? Did you come from a family background that wasn't very religious or nominally so or what? It actually was a broken family. Okay. <laughs> I went to church on Christmas and Easter, okay. and that, that was it. So I, I have several brothers and sisters, and all of them have come to Christ. Really? Then. Yeah. Our, I love our that. parents both passed away before I graduated from high school. Okay. So God is the father of the fatherless. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Can you sort of give us some examples of some of what your interests are if someone ha hasn't gone and read your, your faculty page? Okay. Name us some things you've written. Tell us what you're interested in. Okay. Let me, I'll try to make this succinct. Uh, it, there's several articles on Edwards and published in several journals and the Jonathan oh. Edwards studies and, and so on. And I have a book that I believe will come out this year or next year on Jonathan Edwards' end of creation. Really? Yeah. What publisher? Yes. Uh, the publisher is Vander Heck and Ruprecht. Okay. And what would the title be? It, it would be Jonathan Edwards Concerning the End for Which God Created the World. Exposition, Analysis, and Philosophical Implications. That's the title of the book. And the entire manuscript's done? Is it with the publisher? Yes. Right now, we're just building the two in indices, and okay. I'll hope to send that off this week, and we can have that done. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. I have to say that the idea that God is acting has been so precious and valuable to me. And I first heard it from James Hatch, who taught at Columbia Bible College and Seminary. I wasn't a student there, but I okay. had a chance to encounter his work. Okay. And then I had read Edwards, and as I said, I got three degrees in philosophy on that. Mm -hmm. And my, I'll just tell you, just briefly, my doctoral work was in mathematical logic, 
and economic theory. There are two different sources. Wow. And so I published a book in Cambridge Studies in Philosophy and Law, okay. and it's entitled The Moral Conditions of Economic Efficiency. That, that book is rooted, yeah, that book itself is rooted in a uh, biblical view of property. That was published in 2001. Okay. But it was about that time that I really was interested in not only walking with God myself, mm-hmm. but also the the foundations of math and science rooted in God's acting purposefully. Okay. If God is sustaining all things for his purposes, then what science and math study are the ways God sustains creation. So for mm. close to 20 years, I've sort of tried to connect Edwards with mm. foundations of math and science. Huh. So I have a number of I don't know how many papers, uh, maybe 10 or more papers, showing how math and science is rooted in divine action. Oh, thank you for sharing. This isn't an interview about your PhD thesis, but I would love to get a hold of that book and read some of it, because that's an area that I have some interest in in regards to that phrase you said, the biblical morality of property, was it? Yeah, biblical view of property. Okay, I would love to look at that. I'd, I'd love to talk with you about that. <laughs> Let's uh, dive okay. into some of the things on the academic side. Now, let me quote some of one of your articles. Uh, at the beginning of your Edwards' concept of original ultimate end paper, you write that in Edwards' work, Quote, we have the final version of Jonathan Edwards' painstaking labors to state precisely God's purpose and motive in creating the world, end quote. And later you write that, quote, Edwards' lifelong concern was to experience and then to explain, promote, guide, and defend a view of Christian piety as a work of God by which redeemed persons actually experience God's own Trinitarian self-knowledge, love, and joy. He strove to convince pastors, theologians, and philosophers in Great Britain and colonial America that only thereby can created persons truly know God and worship Him, delight in His presence, and to love each other in genuine fellowship. Thus, Edwards' primary goal in writing the two dissertations was to show, on shared assumptions, that such true virtue is God's ultimate end in creation, End quote. And just a little later, you state, quote, that many of these ideas of God's end in creation that were proposed before and while Edwards was alive could be classified as ultimate ends in Aristotle's sense. However, in Edwards' opinion, given their content, they actually tended to promote a view of religious experience contrary to the gospel. End quote. So, at this point, my question for you would be the following. Outside of the philosophical issue raised by Baruch Spinoza, which we would get in a little bit, if there were ideas of God's end in creation that were there before and while Edwards was alive, ideas that Edwards thought tended to promote a view of religious experience contrary to the gospel, what were those ideas? And how did Edwards think that they promoted a view of religious experience that was contrary to the gospel? Okay, there were several, but probably the most important one was that God created so that humans could could be happy per se. Okay. In 1755, Thomas Clapp, he gave a talk at the meeting of all the pastors in New England. It's called the General Association of the Colony of Connecticut. Okay. And he was talking about this very thing, and he called them fashionable schemes of divinity. And Clapp said that, quote, according to these fashionable schemes, the only end and design in creation is the happiness of the creature. So Thomas Clapp was making this case, and Edwards agreed with him. And the point was, it's that it's happiness per se. And we see something like that in one of our founding documents. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men, so on and so forth, are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights. And one of these is the pursuit of happiness. Okay. Happiness per se. Yeah. And that pursuit then requires a liberty right to do whatever you want within the law. So it's sort of like, choose your life, pursue your projects. Mm -hmm. After all, that's God's purpose for you. And so then the idea was that in doing so, the new scheme of divinity was that you were doing God's purpose anyhow, Mm -hmm. and you're able to choose according to your own reason. And as it turns out, David Hume is famous for raising the problem of evil. If happiness is the purpose of God for human beings, and God is all good, and God is all powerful, how come people aren't happy in that sense? But for Edwards, it wasn't just happiness per se and clap and others. It was happiness in doing the will of God, happiness in being made alive in Christ, Mm. and then choose your vocations prayerfully according to God's will and the gifts that He's given you. And so you can see there's two distinct ways of being a Christian, very subtle, 
but quite distinct. And I think evangelicals still may be a bit confused about that. So happiness per se is different than happiness in God's will. Is that just one of more than one, or is that the primary one? Uh, Outside of the conundrum that Baruch Spinoza raises, is that the fashionable scheme of divinity that Edwards was thinking of? Yes. Okay. You write in your metaphysics article that, quote, Jonathan Edwards holds that God's internal glory is the knowledge, holiness, and in parentheses, love, and blessedness, joy, and happiness that characterize God's intra-Trinitarian life. In chapter one, he argues that God's end in creating and sustaining the world is for this internal glory to exist in and be lived out by a society of redeemed beings. God's motivation for this is from God's disposition to share his internal glory, which itself is grounded in and directed by God's eternally occurrent supreme regard for himself. The argument proceeds from three assumptions. One, God is absolutely self-sufficient and independent. Two, creation is ex nihilo. And three, God has an ultimate end in creating the world. You then note, or end quote, you then note, quote, these assumptions present Edwards with a widely known conceptual problem, end quote. This is where we would get to your mention of Brooke Spinoza and what you refer to as the divine aseity slash divine action conundrum. What was it that Spinoza wrote or that he said that presents a problem for those three assumptions that God is absolutely self-sufficient and independent, creation is ex nihilo, and God has an ultimate end in creating the world? Okay, Baruch Spinoza wrote this in 1677, 30 years before Edwards was born. Okay. But he basically said something like this, and he was talking he was referring to both Jewish and Christian theologians and Christian Protestant and Catholics. He said, All of you, in effect, all of you hold two things. One, that God is absolutely self sufficient, and that God pursues an end in creation. Okay. However, what you seem to overlook, I'm talking Spinoza's voice, yeah. is that the very concept of acting to achieve an end means that the agent does not now possess what he will possess when he achieves his end. So attributing that to God means that God is not self-sufficient because he's acting for something he values that he does not now possess. So that's the, uh, in a nutshell, that's the dilemma Spinoza posed. And he said basically that Jewish and Christian theology is hopelessly incoherent at its core. He said you cannot put those two together. Okay. And then Edwards' work then was intended, was it primarily intended in that regard to address what Spinoza was asserting in in that? Uh, Yeah, that's great. Edwards actually had three goals, and one of the goals was to overcome that Spinoza's conundrum. And he makes this plain sort of obliquely in his section where he entertains objections. So overcoming this problem was a third goal. The primary goal was to establish and ground true virtue or true spirituality or genuine Christian experience in the power of the Holy Spirit. That was his primary goal. And his secondary goal then was to state this in a way so that it would overcome or diminish the fashionable schemes of divinity that we mentioned just a minute ago. And Mm -hmm. then the third goal would be do so in such a way that it logically solve the Spinoza problem. Okay. You mentioned that it was, that for Spinoza, or that for Edwards, this was about giving people an idea of what true Christian experience was. Was that part of a larger project beyond just this work, but a project of which this work was a part? I'd say yes, and I think every Edwards scholar would agree that his primary concern throughout life is that he would know the power of God's resurrection, and then as a pastor and as a father and a husband, Mm -hmm. he could promote that and inculcate that in the people he loved, to know and love God. So, in some sense, kind of a lifelong thing, not just... Absolutely. Okay. No question. Okay. 